Thank you so much, everyone, for joining Darien Library this afternoon for New York National Historic Sites, Seven Wonders to National Parks. This is the beginning of our eight part series. And today we're gonna to begin with this from the Seven Wonders to National Parks. Um, as you can see, romantic landscapes and national parks. So we're joined today by Alan Depre. He's a retired United States park ranger. He's been giving programs for the American and even the international public on the important issues of universal and American values of history found in our national parks and historic sites for over 20 years. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our community collection. Oh my goodness, sorry. How long have I been doing this? We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our community collections available to the community. <laughs> Before we begin, um, I, you know, I hope everyone's excited to learn about the fascinating history of New York. And now I'm gonna pass the mic over to Alan. Thank you, Alan. Th thank you. Th thank you very much for coming. A and uh, this is going to start a, a series about the national parks in basically the New York area. Uh, I suppose that would include Weir Farm as well in Connecticut, which we, we, I did last fall. Uh, I just want to say to start with that uh, doing the uh, national parks in, in, in the New York area and in the Connecticut area as well, uh, I so, soon learned how, uh, how fa uh, familiar uh, and how interconnected the national parks are uh, with the rest of the world. So this is gonna to touch on American history, some European history, some international history as well. And, and so uh, also, and the best way to start would be this, this romantic landscapes uh, and national parks because it starts at the beginning uh, uh, of history just about and how people uh, like to travel and like to see different worlds. Uh, and uh, this sort of puts things in place. And eventually, it's going to ev evolve into the idea of national parks. So we'll start with, as it says, the beginning of our journey. So there you go. And uh, I'm going to start with the seven wonders of the world. And you see that list. Great Pyramid of Giza, Hanging Gardens of Babylon, Statue of Zeus at Olympia, et cetera. Uh, and uh, that idea started in like uh, 20, 25 BC, uh, Philo of Byzantium wrote on the Seven Wonders. Uh, and uh, he called that themata, which is Greek meaning of things to be seen or what we would call must sees. So in the ancient world, there were people who wanted to travel and see things. That was pretty much a small percentage of the population, those who could afford to do so, the time and the money. Also, you have people trading and, and traveling that way. So uh, that would most likely have an effect on the uh, regular person who didn't have the money to do that. Uh, the world map of Herodotus, it shows you uh, some of the places uh, and the great civilizations. You've got the, Egypt, the Egyptian one right there, Assyria, uh, the Middle East, so that's not darkened in. But uh, this was uh, the map uh, of what people, the extent most likely uh, of, of what they could see. And a lot of it was a little too far even for them. And uh, here we have the Egyptian pyramids. Now, go back to that for a second. And uh, this is a, 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 a tome by a gentleman by Jire. Uh, and you see his name on the bottom, which I've got these uh, notes from. And it said in Egypt, under the pharaohs, already people were traveling. There's evidence of uh, amusement, going for experience and relaxation. So uh, there was the idea of traveling for pleasure uh, in ancient Egypt. And some of the places they saw were the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids. 
And of course, there's the Sphinx. Uh, now, Herodotus uh, traveled the world and he described Babylon lying in a great a plain, the sub circumference of it, 22 and a half kilometers. Uh, uh, circumference was 90 kilometers, a wall of 50 meters around Babylon, and there in, in town were these hanging gardens. Now that is a artist rendition of them, how they looked exactly. Uh, we wouldn't know that uh, uh, as well, but some of the symbols on the bottom come from reliefs, etc., in, in ancient ruins. Uh, so uh, this was irrigated by the river and was a considered, according to Herodotus, one of the seven wonders. Uh, here's the Colossus of Rhodes. And uh, uh, that is he is standing right there on a pedestal. Uh, that idea you could see in the Statue of Liberty uh, built in the 19th century. Uh, and, the, and the rays, the crown, uh, looks very much like the a crown of the statue. Uh, how that exactly was, where we, again, this is a, an artist's view of what it might have looked at. I think this is the Temple of Artemis. Now, this is the tomb of Holocarnassus. And uh, I'm going to show you a picture that. Uh, uh, might uh, see some limited similarities uh, between this and another famous structure, which I've already mentioned. Uh, this is an artist's rendition, uh, several of them. And up in the left-hand corner, uh, uh, down there, you see again uh, what uh, this artist uh, decided or hoped it looked like. And down the left-hand corner, you see a circular view of the same. So if I go to the next thing, if this looks familiar to anybody, uh, that is Grant's tomb. And uh, so uh, that was an inspiration to the artist, the architect for the uh, Grant's tomb in, 18, in the 1880s. Uh, this is the great statue of Zeus. Now, lighthouse at Alexandria. And I, uh, the pedestal or this um, structure right here uh, below the circular top uh, reminds me of something else as well and others. And there you could see an artist's rendition of the Lighthouse of Alexandria and the Statue of Liberty again. And you'll notice the pedestal that uh, the statue is sitting on. Uh, and so there are similarities there. Uh, some of the things you should know, and we can go to the Greeks. They traveled to Delphi, Delphi and uh, to question the oracle. They participated in the Pythian Games and the Olympic Games. We've already talked about Herodotus. And uh, we go from there to the ancient Roman uh, period. And uh, some of the statistics there. Uh, there were 90,000 kilometers of major roads and 200,000 of rural roads by the third century. They were built for trade and movements of armies, but also, and also by boat, boat obviously, for, for those same reasons. Uh, but they also were used by those the travelers. There were inns along the major roads. Classical Romans liked to travel uh, for holidays. Uh, the development of the roads and that infrastructure, of course, made travel much easier. And you can compare that to the 19th century when we talk about that. Hopefully, we'll get that far. And uh, as I said, by the third century, there were all of those uh, roads built. And by the first century, there were actually a, a tourist economy and, and uh, business folks who made their living by getting, uh, showing the uh, writing uh, travel books uh, and uh, working with inns and, and uh, places to stay and uh, groups in some of these cities that the Romans traveled to, to set up accommodations for them and guidebooks even. Uh, and I like this last line, well-off Romans sought relaxation in the seaside, resorts in the south or past the time on the beaches of Egypt 
and Greece on a bathing holiday. A, a uh, Roman court from one of the houses, I think this is either in Pompeii or, or perhaps it's a reconstruction of it. Uh, this, I believe, is also one of the murals uh, on the walls in Pompeii and one, of the, and one of the houses there. And you'll notice the birds and the flowers and the love of nature. So there was a desire to see the great wonders of the world, uh, many of them uh, man-made structures, but also a love of nature and the bucolic scene. Uh, I believe this is Hadrian's villa. I don't think too many regular Romans went there but it shows you uh, a, a place of relaxation for an emperor and the artwork there. So all of these things were important to the uh, upper classes in ancient Rome. Uh, here is a view of a plan of the Appian Way uh, and you see how far it goes. And then of course, after uh, going to the end of Italy, perhaps then you could hop on a boat you were traveling through Italy, or I guess you could go through Rome. And these are Roman roads. And here we, oops, excuse me. And here we have a map of the Mediterranean and the, the Appian Way and traveling across the sea itself. Of course, uh, part of the journey would be by boat. And so here are some of the types of boats they had at the time for uh, trade and travel. And I believe this is, uh, I don't think this is Pompeii. I, this might be one of the cities in, uh, in the Middle East in Roman times or North Africa. Uh, an example or a, a model of the ancient city of Rome about a million people. This is probably the third century. Famous things to see in Rome, the Hippodrome, the Colosseum right there in the center. And uh, the library at Alexandria to the left and a artist's view of Alexandria itself on the right. These would be, all could be, would be tourist uh, attractions. Now this is Bath in England. And of course that the mineral waters were famous even in ancient times. And of course, Romans of occupation who lived there and also settled there in the Roman period when they, after they conquered Britain uh, would be going to these spas. And the idea of nature again, formal gardens, this is a Versailles, I, I, uh, I believe, but it shows you the influence of the past up into the 18th, 17th century when this was created. This is Westbury Gardens, the idea of formal gardens and lots of flowers and paths to walk through is an ancient idea, uh, a Roman idea as well. Uh, now, I jumped ahead a bit with the fall of the Roman Empire and the decline and fall, uh, a lot of people weren't traveling anymore. Uh, it was too dangerous. They didn't have the uh, infrastructure. They could follow Roman roads, but uh, uh, many of them had deteriorated. So it was a different situation. And the, um, the idea of medieval society, when you get out of the dark ages, middle e evil society was beginning to, uh, to develop. And you could see uh, some of the ways they would have traveled. Uh, merchants, students, soldiers, pilgrims, journeymen, beggars, and robbers. There were fairs uh, uh, that were very popular that uh, people would travel to, to see the goods, uh, to get entertainment. And uh, of course, here is a pilgrimage. And this is a modern day version of a pilgrim. <laughs> and uh, one of the fairs uh, on the left, I don't know where that is. I don't think that's important, but this is the type of thing in the cities that were growing that became popular. I believe this guy is a money exchanger uh, at the time, which would have been impor an important uh, function of one of these fairs as well. Uh, some of the goods you might see, see we have some shoes up there and one of the ships uh, of trade. Now, uh, as the uh, world developed, and of course we're emphasizing Europe here, 
uh, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, the elites of Europe uh, the, uh, wanted to uh, send their children on tours to be educated after university. So this is uh, a big change, of course, but this is an 18th century view of some of the things, some of the places, a big art gallery where the uh, travelers would stop at. This is something you did for your education and your enlightenment. Notice the picture of the Colosseum, and I think that's the Baths of Caracalla at the, at, below that, and the Pantheon, which is still standing uh, in beautiful condition in Rome. Oh, wrong one, sorry about that. Uh, so this would be a precursor of modern tourism. It was the grand tour taken by the young nobles, as I said. Uh, and uh, there was a whole system of getting around by carriage, by boat. Uh, some of it could be difficult if you were crossing the Ar Alps, but it was done. For some young uh, gentlemen of the time it, uh, in Rome, you see the Colosseum at the uh, uh, left, and I think that might be the Arch of Constantine to the right. Here we are some ruins. You had to see more ruins as you went along. And one of the towns and some uh, noble ladies and uh, uh, they're cavorting there and travel as it went on. Uh, it, it said in one of my researches that uh, ladies often went on these tours. I wasn't quite sure of that and something I wasn't able to look into further. Uh, I think this is the house from Downton Abbey, so that's where some of these aristocrats would be coming from, though I think that might be a later period. There's the Pantheon, some of the ruins you might see. And of course, uh, you see the uh, symbols of uh, deaths all over the place, but this could be how a grand tour uh, in different forms of travel could would have been done at the time. Now, as times developed and the middle class grew up, the aristocrats, of course, middle class people would want to travel. Now you saw a great deal of classical influence in modern Europe, but you also saw the idea of romantic poets and painters uh, de uh, developing the idea of seeing great natural wonders. And here's Caspar David Friedrich, a uh, wanderer above a sea fog. And I have a lot of um, uh, slides of his work, so I'll, I'll admit some of them are very beautiful. But this was the sublime, to bring out your emotions, your feelings for beauty, awe and terror of nature, as it says. And uh, poets got into the fact, here's Wordsworth, and a quote from his uh, work, that nature utters from her rural shrine, meek, nobly versed in simple discipline. He found the longest summer day too short to his loved pastime given by Seji Lee or down the tempting maze of Shawford Brook, fairer than life itself in this sweet book. So here he's getting inspiration from nature. Now Wordsworth was an interesting fellow. He turned into be quite a conservative, conservative as he got older. But he was one of the first pres preservationists or the idea of preservation, pre preserving. And he wrote about um, uh, uh, saving uh, these famous places like the, uh, keeping the Lake District as pure as possible. He opposed the railroad in 1845 that was going through the uh, Lake District. Uh, and uh, in 1835, he called for that area to be set aside as national property. Now, George Catlin in the US in the same period called for a nation's or nation's park. So you see the antecedents of uh, the idea of preserving areas of the uh, world and of the land uh, for enlightenment and inspiration and also for education. And uh, I'll, I'll into another piece of poetry here. I believe this is Wordsworth, it says it on the bottom. Yes, take all that's mine beneath the moon. If I with her but half a noon may sit beneath the walls of some old cave or mossy nook when she winds along the brook to hunt waterfalls. 
And here's Wordsworth again. It was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem appareled in celestial light. Now, this is the age of the great rise of the middle class. We all know Walt Whitman. I'll just go over that as well, but I like this line, give me odorous of sunrise, a garden of beautiful flowers where I can walk undisturbed. And Desert Places by Robert Frost, inspiration as well. Uh, this is a more formalized view of, uh, uh, of natural beauty. And um, I wandered lonely as a cloud. And of, of, for oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Uh, so all of this uh, uh, was uh, uh, part of the enlightenment of the uh, middle class. A as the middle class prospered, more time to read, more time to travel. Of course, it was difficult uh, through the 18th century, not as difficult perhaps as the Middle Ages, probably more difficult than it might have been in Roman times. You still had to uh, the, uh, use horsepower, and uh, sailing ships to get around. But there was a movement among the upper classes and middle classes to actually see something of the world and be inspired, especially as this romantic age came along. I apologize for the structure in the back. But even in cities, the idea of parks came along. And this is the idea here. Uh, now, we're going to get into some of the great landscapes uh, I believe this is Ireland. This is uh, Friedrich again, uh, on the top of a mountain looking off into the horizon, very religious with a Christ figure there as well. And here we go again, the more, uh, the great inspiration of nature. So we're gonna go over these fairly quickly. Some of them, of course, are very beautiful. I guess that's Friedrich himself standing there on the high rocks of a mountainside. Uh, and again, and ruins. This is another artist as well. I believe this is actually maybe Thomas Cole. I have it all in my notes uh, uh, there. Uh, so pardon if my memory is lacking here a bit. And what you would begin to see, of course, was the natural world, but also castles. Uh, that would be an inspiration. Remember, this is the Romantic Age, the Gothic, uh, uh, what the Gothic idea, Ivanhoe, etc. And of course, uh, Sir Walter Scott uh, did a great in, in, uh, influence in presenting the Middle Ages and the natural wonders of the world as well. So you're going to see ruins in a lot of things. I think this is Church, the American artist. Here we have some more. All great natural beauty. Here's a village. Uh, that's part of what you're going to see, the bucolic going back to nature, seeing uh, peasants working in the field, villages. Uh, this is actually in Connecticut, uh, where this scene was done. I believe this is coal again. Some more of the natural wonders. This is Frederick Church, Niagara Falls. And another view as well. Of course, we're getting into the Hudson River School of Painting and then later on the Rocky Mountain River School. And so these paintings whetted the appetite. I believe the uh, tree on the left is actually, uh, this may be Moran, and it's actually, uh, is it, there's a, there's a place in Darien where this was uh, painted from. Probably most of you know it. I'm not from Darien. So uh, I might not have seen it, but uh, is it Pear Street Point? Uh, Pear Tree Point? I'm not quite sure. But again, even the local, this is a scene uh, of Long Island. And so you see uh, uh, the great uh, world of nature, its inspiration. This is, I believe, the domes of Yosemite. And if you want to see a copy of that, let's see, there's obviously, that's the original here again. But if you, uh, this is the painting done by Bierstadt 
And you can see a copy of that because it used to be hanging there in the Lockwood Matthews Mansion in Norwalk. There it is on the left. Uh, uh, Grand Lockwood was a big art collector of traditional things in the 1860s and 1870s. And these, some of these houses, uh, some of the great estates or the great houses in New York actually had separate galleries. The idea was that people could come off the street and look at the great uh, uh, collections of some of the big um, tycoons at the time. I doubt if that was done very often, but the idea was there. More beer stat. And of course, this is uh, some other scenes as well. Out West, National Parks, this is Moran, his painting of it. There he is again. And so you can see that the natural wonders were an inspiration to artists at the time to get back to nature, to feel inspired. Uh, and uh, that was what was going on with all of this. And we'll go through that fairly quickly. Echo Lake, Franconia Notch, New Hampshire. I've been there. That was a great place. And there's another view of it. Uh, some of the ruins you might see in places like Europe. Uh, this is, I believe, um, Thomas Cole again. It's church. Oh, I'm sure, I hope we have some questions about all of this. And I'm going through it pretty, pretty quickly. But I think we all get the idea. And they're very nice to look at. Uh, and of course, here's some of our ruins. We have European ruins and we have our uh, Southwest ruins that people were going who wa wanted to visit them, had the money and the time to do so. so. All this idea of ruins, of course, influenced us here in the United States. If we couldn't go to Europe, uh, we could if we had the money. Uh, we uh, we could travel in the United States. It's going to be difficult out west before 1869. Uh, I believe it was 1869 when the railroads railroads were connected, uh, and uh, now you could travel by railroad. But we'll get to that in a minute. And even then, they had problems of tourists trying to chip uh, souvenirs away. But there you go. Southwest, a tower, ruined tower in uh, Europe. It's the natural bridge in Virginia. I believe that's a church uh, again. It's mid uh, 19th century. Okay, so some artists see the beauty in the world of progress. That should have been at the beginning of this and not at the end, <laughs> but anyway. Oh no, here we go. Some artists with all the natural things and the ruins, J. Alden Weir uh, did a factory scene. Is that Wilmington, Connecticut, I believe? Uh, but again, you see the, you could either say industry encroaching on the environment or in, they're interrelated. It's still a natural scene in many ways and also a factory scene at the same time. So he's able to see beauty in that as well as nature. And here we go again. Here's another view of uh, a factory town in Connecticut by J. Alden Weir. This is by his brother. Now I'm getting into the industrial things as well because that became an inspiration. Power, progress. This is the forging of the shaft, I believe, by his brother, John Ferguson Weir. And uh, so all these pictures were presenting uh, to the middle class, especially uh, before it was aristocrats, uh, but all of the those who invested in, in in industry and business and businessmen, they wanted their wives and children to travel and to see the rest of the world for their education and also to tell everybody else that you did it as well. Now I, I have this civilization on the mark, lesser march, lesser beings and higher. Excuse me for a minute. Again, factories, more factories. Uh, forging of the shaft again. There's another scene of steel making as well. And some of the industrial complexes in the world. And then some of the slums. Uh, this is London, I believe, in the 1890s probably. Of course, some of the sadder scenes in New York at the time. 
and more factory assembly line that says Ford Ford Company, so the early Model P. Busy cities, uh, tenements, child labor and, and sweatshops, early education. Uh, and then we see a family, probably maybe lower middle class, reading, uh, playing games, and sort of lower middle class townhouses, maybe in the kitchen. And uh, I bring this up because what was happening at the time, the, even for the wealthy, they wanted to get away from the cities. They wanted to get away from the pressures of modern life. So you're going to see a lot of spas uh, come up, like and, and gambling and, and racetracks and places to drink the waters, like Saratoga. And so that idea that the upper crust did, the aristocrats, uh, became a popular idea with new aristocrats, a business industry. And uh, again, scenes of New York, scenes of the more prosperous, a, uh, that didn't come out too well. It looks like that's a German advertisement. Uh, no, French, excuse me. And uh, Lumiere, a Lumiere, Luminaire. And uh, a middle-class family, more lower, middle, middle, middle income, income places. And these people were going to be able to actually take a holiday once in a while. Here, of course, is we have more of the upper class uh, structures, uh, townhouses. And here is, uh, 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 this looks like an orphanage. So I don't think that it goes into what we're talking about. But anyway, uh, some of the fashions of the time that the, uh, uh, the well-to-do uh, uh, could dress their wives in, and uh, a very uh, prosperous family with a, a, a very large family, looks like mother and father, grandpa, and children. These are the people that would be traveling. This looks like the 1870s, and here's another group, and some of the houses they lived in, and they get grander as they go along. That's Westbury Gardens again. That was the Phipps family who owned that on Long Island. You can see that today and travel there. It's a gorgeous place to see and the grounds especially. More of middle-class homes, middle-class structures. And this is going to be the places they wanted to see. Uh, France, the Eiffel Tower, Egypt. Uh, this is, and I'm sorry, I, I forgot the name at this point. Uh, but is, have anybody seen some like at Hop? This is where I believe it was filmed. This is in California, though, and not Florida. I believe this was built in the latter part of the 19th century. This is some of the places that the middle class people would be going to. But also, I see we, this is actually a park ranger. It looks like it's the 1920s. The uh, uh, National Park Service was started in 1916. Uh, before that, of course, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, now Franklin, excuse me, Teddy Roosevelt, though Franklin later on did a lot to preserve and make national parks as well. Uh, uh, but this is the Grand Canyon. And uh, obviously see you, you see a group of tourists who are taking a look at it. Now, we talked about the wealthy being able to get there. And then we see the beginnings of something for all. Central Park. So anybody could go to Central Park. You didn't need to be rich. You can enjoy park and parkland. Uh, uh, the city fathers in New York were very far-sighted uh, for that park and many others. And many of the very wealthy uh, philanthropists wanted parks for everybody to enjoy. There's a scene of uh, enjoyment, if I put it that way. I showed you that one before. I don't know where Whitworth Park is, maybe somebody does, uh, but you see people strolling, taking their children, and of course, this is Central Park, the Dakotas up behind there, and this could be for everybody. Here we go again, and of course, ice skating. Now, uh, popular sports, popular entertainment, baseball, football, all of these, uh, I guess, uh, uh, rugby, et cetera, 
soccer, all of those things became popular with the common man, with the working class, and as also as well as some of uh, some of the more uh, upper crust. So all of this was developing uh, as people became educated, as people uh, got better jobs, as they rose up in the world, they were going to want to travel too. So for the people who can, let's go take a look. All right, these are these are tourists in the sewers of Paris. Uh, I'm sure this is an American group out west. Look at the fashionable lady up there on the right. Uh, I think this is Tiso, and of course he's showing people on an excursion, uh, probably going uh, across the channel. Here we go again. Some of the uh, middle class, and as time went by, uh, uh, middle class and upper class dressed more and more alike, uh, and even the lower the lower groups of people did as well. Egypt. Uh, getting ready to take a steamship on your travels. Venice, uh, some of the ruins, uh, is that Luxor? Uh, some of the ruins in Egypt as well, another large group of travelers. Caverns in the United States, a group of tourists, who knows uh, what group they were. Probably middle-class folks. And more travel, more travel will move along. And I say a new age of Vox Populi, because now many people were traveling or were going to be able to travel. And uh, the Great Western uh, uh, Railway, railway you, you'd expect to see an advertisement in the United States, but actually it's in England. They want you to see Cornwall. Cornwall and Italy, lots of similarities between the two. How much is, is beyond shape? I don't know. Uh, and the beginnings of the National Park Service, I'll just go over that briefly. 1864, under the uh, uh, Lincoln administration, uh, Abraham Lincoln granted uh, this land to the state of Cal Cal California for public use. And it was the first time in history that the federal government set aside scenic lands to protect them and allow people to enjoy them. By 1906, it was returned to the, as a national park to the federal government. And this is, of course, Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant uh, was instrumental in, in uh, preserving uh, Yellowstone, 1872, signed into law, establishing Yellowstone as the, first, as the world's first national park. Uh, now, every time you mention Ulysses S. Grant, he's one of my favorites of all American history. And wouldn't you know it, that he would be farsighted enough to want to do that. Uh, and it was also, he thought, good for business because um, there were new systems of travel that made it much easier than in the past. So we'll go into that in a min minute. But as time went on, you could see over 2 million acres of land in, in Wyoming and Montana territories were set aside. And it goes on, Mount Rainier in 1899, uh, the sequoias I've mentioned, Crater Lake, Oregon, uh, Wind Cave, South Dakota, Sully Hills, North Dakota, uh, pardon the uh, bad spelling. And of course, that would have been under the famous Teddy Roosevelt, signed by Antiquities Act of 1906, signed by Roosevelt, President Theodore Roosevelt. The idea was to uh, protect prehistoric cliff dwellings, the Pueblo ruins, which I just showed you. And so we get into preserving the man-made structures that were part of the, of the nation. Uh, so presidents could now set aside land to pro proclaim and announce and reserve and preserve historic landmark marks. And that's under Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I could, if, if I'm, uh, well, I, see, I guess we still have quite a bit of time left. And then it just goes 1960, the Enabling Act, and that created the National Park Service. Uh, so that made it official. So they all came under the wing, these parks of the National Park. That is, of course, the arrowhead. And this is interesting, and I used to point this out to the kids, uh, that uh, you have uh, the great natural wonders 
uh, of of the war of the West, and there's the sequoia tree on the left, the bison. Uh, and uh, so that shows the natural wonders that needed to be preserved. Of course, this whole list is this is under Franklin Roosevelt, who was a great conservationist and very instrumental in expanding the national parks. And of course, this monument was early. Uh, I forget, I, was it finished in the 1850s? Uh, my memory fails me here. But this would have been a man-made structure important to our history, to, to our politics. Uh, and this is in uh, really memorial to the great George Washington. The Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, uh, the Lincoln Memorial, uh, the, the latest uh, uh, Martin Luther King, the late, one of the latest ones, quite impressive. Uh, this is one of the national cemeteries from the Civil War. And uh, so this is part of the preservation that was going on all the way to the present time. Mission of 66, Wilderness Act of 64, Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, a lot of land and monuments to cover. Uh, and there you go. And we're going all the way up National Parks and Recreation Areas, Endangered Species Act. All of this was part of the preservation uh, of the modern age coming from the 19th century. Veil agenda, management, scientific research to preserve the parks, not just saying, isn't that nice and let's just guard them, but how to make them prosper and grow. This is just some of the uh, uh, arcs in, I think it's the, the final is 417, uh, nat natural wonders and man-made structures, uh, some tourists, something I wouldn't do. Uh, that's a little more interesting, more my style. All out west visiting these parks. This is out of sequence. There should have been back up with the popular sports. I believe this is one of the first teams in the latter part of the 19th century uh, who had traveled from Australia uh, to play in England. So we have the idea of uh, actually traveling sports teams and becoming uh, great celebrities in their own right. Back to more tourists, very rustic. And uh, as you see, uh, these uh, gentlemen <laughs> and the dog, I don't know where that is. This is Niagara Falls, uh, the Conestoga wagon. That's one way of traveling out west. I don't think too many people who weren't going out there to settle would be happy using that. So this is one of the, uh, shall we say, we talk of infrastructure. This is part of it. This is the way that you could get around without a great deal of trouble by railroad and railroads of course, uh, were created by the new technology of the 19th century. This was a great period of, uh, of technology. So you're going to have the railroad, the steamship, it's going to get, well, we could talk about the electric light, uh, uh, the automobile, uh, uh, natural gas, lightning, lighting, and electricity. So all of these made life easier. All of these were produced by workers as well, who were, even with all the labor troubles of the 19th century, uh, really made some of the highest wages in the world at the time. So this is how you would get out west, uh, uh, much easier. And uh, says America's greatest combination scenic tour. And this, of course, 1928, but you're still traveling by railroads. So you're going, going to go on vacation. Ulysses S. Grant saw that. When he wanted Yellowstone uh, preserved, he thought it would be good for business because they were already, in, in places like Niagara Falls, building hotels, et cetera, uh, for tourists. So you, to get to those hotels, you'd take a train, much easier. Much more, many more people could get there it was cheaper. As you became more prosperous, uh, you could do that by the thousands and even by the millions. And of course, here's Yosemite. And this, I believe, is also a railroad advertisement. 
and a park ranger with a visitor. Again, I saw that before, and here are some very, <laughs> these guys look like they're uh, part of the staff at this park. And uh, here we go again. And this were all railroad advertisements, but also on the left, you see something else that was very important, the automobile. Now you could hop in the car and go on a paved, paved roads and highways uh, that we got, it be, became uh, more and more mileage was included in that. And you could travel to these places uh, with uh, much less expense, hop in the car and go. And of course, at this time, the working man was getting two weeks vacation, many of them. So there, that's what you do. You go and travel around and see some of these great places. One of the hotels or, or lodges. And here's another one. Of course, I, for, I didn't mention the steamship. That's how you got to, to Europe in a week or so when it took a month before. So here we go. And here we have two of them together, steamship and the railroad. New technology, we talk about the modern age and all the technology that has made progress. Well, this is where it started. These were great changes and events in how the world was run and used. Here's a riverboat in Campbell and an early automobile. Uh, we have uh, one of the parks in use. I don't know where that is exactly. Now we get on to this, the great Statue of Liberty. The head and shoulders um, were put on display, I believe, in uh, Central Park. I don't think it was Central Park. And I used to know this. Uh, I'm ashamed of myself that I don't. It was on my tour all the time. Uh, but this was the first thing that was finished and brought over to advertise the oncoming Statue of Liberty. And of course, you were going to have to put the Statue of Liberty on a pedestal. French gave us the Statue of Liberty. They didn't give us the pedestal. So we were going to have to build that. So this was whetting the appetite of the people of the United States to raise the money to do so. Of course, Pullman car, interior, it looks like the late, probably 1880s, maybe a little earlier. And this is traveling in style, as you can see. Of course, from that to <laughs> the great age of the automobile, the present time. And of course, tourists uh, very crowded, <laughs> so much for <laughs> communing with nature in isolation, but it's still a great idea. And of course, the bison crossing the road, I guess part of the hazardous in your travel to some of the natural park, the national parks out west. And uh, I, I just want to go briefly, uh, let's see, let's go back, let's see what I can make up, make in conclusion of this not make up. There was great changes in the world, especially from the 17th and 18th century through the 19th century. It set the, uh, shall we say, the tracks down for uh, uh, mod the modern age, the modern age of the common man prospering as well uh, as the, uh, shall we say, the upper crust and also the middle class in between. And all this technology was going to make it easier for people to get around and see these things. Uh, the great steamships, which made travel much easier, and there was going to be a, a, a lot more uh, intercontinental travel after World War I, but the great steamships in their steerage, even the Titanic, the steerage, not steerage, uh, the uh, uh, carried the immigrants in the third class. And they made, uh, in those days, late uh, 19th century, $50,000 a boy voyage, uh, pretty much a lot of money in those days to make on one trip from third class. And many of those people were, of course, going to be landing at Ellis Island. So the uh, modern age of the steamship has a lot to do with making the lives of emigrants and immigrants much easier to get to where they wanted to go. And that included the United States as well as South America, Australia, et cetera. And here's some of the things we'll be talking about. The Statue of Liberty as we go along. 
And that's the new, no, that's the old torch that was in the museum. Ellis Island, we'll be talking about that. Uh, the interior Great Hall. There is originally, it was just one island and uh, then two, and then the, uh, the ones on the, the, the left, two islands were connected. And we'll talk about how that got to be as well. Uh, there's Federal Hall, Grant's Tomb, the African Burial Ground. So we start on the left, Federal Hall, Grant's Tomb, African Burial Ground, and Alexander Hamilton's The Grange. We'll be talking about all of them. There's a view of the African Burial Ground. I was there as a ranger that was, uh, that was there for a few years as well. And we'll be talking about that. Uh, this is a slave market in New York. A federal hall with the statue of George Washington there on the steps. And, and uh, that actually is George first. Well, that's federal hall, excuse me. And there's that statue again. So I shouldn't jump ahead too far because I don't want people to by repeating some of these things and some of the uh, other uh, talks I'm going to give. But there's plenty of uh, new stuff that you'll be hearing about as well. That's Alexander Hamilton, the Grange inside, Ulysses S. Grant, Grant's tomb, Castle Clinton, Federal Ford Entertainment Center, Immigration Central National Historic Site. I was also, that was one of my uh, uh, sites as well. And we'll get into that. I won't be talking about Teddy Roosevelt. I didn't have enough time to do that. There he is uh, when he went down to the building of the Panama Canal, sitting in one of the great um, uh, uh, structures there to move uh, uh, the dirt around. And that's the canal finished. Alfred Nobel, I wonder why I put him in there. But anyway, he's uh, someone that you could be uh, inspired by. This is St. Paul's. And this is not, uh, uh, let's see, this is, in, gee, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. So I'll, we'll have to find out about that later when I remember. This is some of the, uh, the, the parks in the harbor itself. Staten Island, there's uh, some of the forts in New York that I will not be talking about. There's uh, Fort A, no, Castle Williams, excuse me, the largest fort in the harbor built for the War of 1812. Okay, uh, any questions about all this? Let's see, that's the uh, Immigrant Museum in New York. And we end with a few pictures of Weir Farm, which I covered in J. Alden Weir. And thank you for coming. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Or comments. Thank you, Alan, so much. So we have a few questions for you. So the first one, someone asked, can a presidential administration usually, um, sorry, actually take back federal land or is it preserved forever? Um, they said they're thinking about the former president, Donald Trump, and how he removed protections from public lands. That's a good question. And uh, I, it looks like you can. Uh, I thought it was, as you saw by that act, he could make it. Teddy Roosevelt signed that law that he could uh, actually set property aside or sites aside, et cetera. And I think... Uh, it's a constitutionally question. I think it'll be something that have to be decided by the courts eventually on how that works. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll do some research on that next time and I will find out more specifically, but I've been led to believe that it is something that probably the Supreme Court would have to make a decision on. Now you have a new president and I believe he could change it back. So that's one of the interesting things in our constitution and our laws, or basically laws that are passed, which show you the, what, when people may pass a law, they may not think about what the consequence was, consequences of it being rescinded uh, might be. So I, I hope I answered that. And uh, if you come for another session, I'll try to, ha I'll have the answer for you more specifically. Thank you. And someone else wanted to know what national park is the most visited? And I, I'm oh. assuming they're talking about in our area, in New York. Uh, that would be the Statue of Liberty above all, all of them. So 
uh, Castle Clinton is an interesting place in itself in New in Manhattan, but that's actually the embarkation point for going to the Statue of Liberty. So many people who go to Castle Clinton are coming to, for, to collect their tickets or their passes and to get on the boats to go to the Statue of Liberty. So mm -hmm. I, what is it, 5 million a year? That, that's the last statistics I heard. Uh, it may be more than that, uh, but yeah, that is the most, and that is internationally famous. It's a world heritage site as well. So you're just going to have everybody coming. And it, interestingly enough, the French are very proud of that statue. All the French people I've, I've spoken to at the Statue of Liberty uh, are, are very much in admiration of the whole thing. And I'll get more get into that in greater detail when I talk about the Statue of Liberty. Now, which national park is the most visited during the winter time? Does that change? I, I wouldn't know. Okay, I'm got sorry. It, got it. I wouldn't okay. know. But that's something else I could. I guess we could look into. Or uh, actually, some of the guys and, and ladies who are what who are uh, in this program here or, or, or watching the slideshow could do that. But I'll try. I'll try. I remember that as well. I need to take some notes down that I'm answering some of these questions for next time. Now, is there a park that kind of is a little bit forgotten that doesn't get, you know? you don't think it's visited as much or is that something you might know? Okay, uh, there's two. Cas if you're talking about this area, Castle Clinton mm -hmm. is not, uh, uh, there isn't too much interest in it by the tourists who, who come. Uh, they wanna get to the Statue of Liberty, but it's an interesting place in its own, in its own right. And there used to be tours talking about there are, I don't know, eight, 10 forts around there that can be talked about on a tour. You could take a brief walking tour, tour to look at Castle William from across the bay over there uh, on Governor's Island and Fort Jay. You could also go there. Uh, and so that these are places that are very worthy. Now, Grant's tomb when I, when I actually uh, applied to be transferred there, I, I, I got from other rangers, what do you want to go there for? Nobody goes up there. Well, many, many uh, tourists come on Saturday and Sunday, bus tours. And they, that's one of the places they stop at. Uh, so it, it has a, a visitor, visitation of a couple hundred thousand a year at least. Uh, but it's one of the best places to go to. And, and I could talk about that, of course, when, I, when, when we do do, do Grant's Tomb. Uh, it also is basically, it's not, it doesn't emphasize uh, Ulysses S. Grant's uh, military career so much. That's part of it, but it, it's his presidency. And uh, Ulysses S. Grant was one of the greatest maligned presidents especially his uh, administration as president, because it was, he was a uh, reconstruction president. He was, he, he was a believer in the program of the radical Republicans. So when you got into the lost cause of the Confederacy business, latter part, it actually started uh, almost right after the Civil War, but at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century, and I don't want to go, because uh, this will be part of what I'm talking about. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant was much, uh, he was just someone that, well, corruption, uh, he was stupid, uh, he was uh, easily fooled. And uh, right down the road from Grant's tomb is a, uh, a, a development on 125th Street. And those are the Ulysses S. Grant apartments, public housing. And uh, he has a very high standing with the African American community because of the things he did for Reconstruction. So between Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses John, uh, Ulysses Johnson, <laughs> uh, Lyndon Johnson, he was the greatest civil rights president. And so he, so that's part of the reason why he's not visited so much, and he should be. And of course, it's a little bit out of the way as well. And we have one more question. What site did you enjoy working on the most? Well, it was Grant's tomb. I, 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 I loved 
the Statue of Liberty, and I loved Grant's tomb. And Grant's tomb, again, well, I'll stop on Grant's tomb, but the Statue of Liberty uh, is a very inspirational place. Uh, you're able to uh, talk about uh, a lot of things going on in the 19th century, including the Civil War, including also the new technologies, uh, the, the growth of advertising, uh, mass produced newspapers. Uh, and remember the Statue of Liberty was an advertisement for Republican government, for constitutions. The Frenchman who uh, dreamed up the idea with Bartholdi uh, was an expert on American history. Uh, he was a professor. And he didn't like uh, Napoleon III, and he wanted a republic. So the idea was an advertisement to, to the French as well to say, hey, we need to get back to ha having a republic. And the great revolution, which should have led to a republic, now has the emperor. Napoleon III wasn't too happy with that kind of stuff. But it is an advertisement, an idea, an ideal. Uh, for uh, uh, constitutions, republics, bills of rights, et cetera, and so forth. So it's very important as that as well, as a, and also as a symbol of immigrants. Uh, but we could talk about that when we get to that period. Okay. Um, this has been wonderful. Um, if you would like to check out next week, same time, same place, well, different link, of course, um, we're going to be talking about Federal Hall and then the week after that, we're going to talk about the African burial ground. So please sign up if you want to join us for those adventures. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you again, Alan. This has been fantastic. You're welcome. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.